Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the ARCO Public Affairs Forum here at the Kennedy School. Tonight, we're extremely pleased to have the chairperson of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, Elizabeth Moeller, who's going to be speaking to us about electricity industry restructuring, developing a new public policy. We're particularly pleased to uh, have her here on our platform because uh, it is so relevant to the things that are being done here at the Kennedy School of Government. For many years, uh, uh, various faculty members have been participating in the analysis and the research and indeed the advocacy of various points of view in public policy with respect to energy. And in the last several years in particular, we've had here the Harvard Electricity Policy Group under the leadership of Professor William Hogan, which has become certainly one of the foremost, if not the foremost, uh, uh, centers for the discussion, analysis, research, uh, on the uh, critical and very complex issues uh, surrounding the uh, historic changes that are occurring uh, in this sector of our economy. And indeed, um, it goes well beyond our own borders, uh, the work being done here and the advice being given uh, to uh, policymakers uh, worldwide as there is a transformation everywhere. But secondly, but in addition to the energy work uh, being done here, uh, our new dean of the school, Joseph Nye, has launched a major new project called Visions and Governance in the 21st Century, uh, which held its first uh, major uh, conference retreat uh, this summer with uh, several dozen uh, uh, major academics from here at the university and from a few other universities as well to seriously re-examine what the role of government will be in our society in the future. And it's very appropriate that we have uh, Chair Moeller here who, in a very practical uh, uh, basis, is working out some of the very significant redefinition of uh, the role of government uh, as regulator of this major industry. Indeed, there's a major challenge to how we govern uh, with respect to these issues, both which activities will be regulated who will regulate them, federal government, state government, or some are proposing, uh, indeed, that we create new regional kind of entities to do it. And there's a whole new uh, examination of what the role of the regulator will be, indeed, perhaps becoming the protector of competition in the new world. And finally, we're very pleased to, uh, and feel that her appearance is very relevant to us here at the Kennedy School uh, because of her uh, extraordinary leadership as a public servant, and indeed, uh, if not the major mission of uh, the Kennedy School, one of its major missions is to inspire and train uh, folks in the public establishment uh, to effectively lead. And uh, she has certainly been uh, doing that at the Federal Energy Regulatory uh, Commission. She was first, uh, she was appointed a chair of the commission uh, upon the arrival of President Clinton uh, to Washington uh, in February of 1993. She had been appointed to the commission as a commissioner, as the Democrat appointee, by, at the end of the Reagan uh, term in office by President Reagan, and she was reappointed by President Bush. So she served at, under several administrations in this independent regulatory uh, agency. Uh, prior to that time, she had served as a senior counsel uh, to the U.S. Senate Energy and Natural Resources uh, Committee. Uh, having uh, come to the Senate to work for Senator Henry Jackson, uh, whom many in the audience will remember, but not everybody will remember. Uh, we're discovering the generational differences in this audience. <laughs> we, have, we have a constituent uh, declaring uh, uh, long-standing loyalty and support here, uh, and, uh, and Senator Bennett Johnson uh, of Louisiana. She's a lawyer by training. She's the mother of an 11-year-old and a 5-year-old uh, uh, at this point, so there are obviously many demands on her time. But indeed, uh, her service is one of very remarkable uh, leadership because uh, she and the other four commissioners are embarking on a, a whole new direction uh, for this uh, major industry in our country. Uh, everyone that deals with it, and we have a number of those people in the audience, they've come from across the country to the meeting today of the Harvard Electricity Policy Group, uh, understand that these are very complex issues uh, of economics and of regulation, uh, and indeed they represent major political forces in our society uh, contending over uh, very high uh, stakes. Uh, and um, her actions and her commissioner's actions uh, come under uh, not only intense scrutiny 
uh, of media and the various stakeholders in our society, but in particular are challengeable in the courts and challengeable in the Congress. And the remarkable thing about this commission has been that so far it's had both a high degree of unity among its commissioners in its major decision, uh, uh, orders 888 and 889, uh, but also it's had a high degree of acceptance of those decisions uh, thus far in the uh, political community in Washington on a bipartisan basis. And in this time of extremely high partisanship uh, in our country, and particularly at this time of the year, uh, I think it's well worth noting uh, that this is a commission that is Democrat by majority, dealing with a Congress that is Republican by majority. They are implementing legislation that was crafted by a Democratic Congress working with a Republican president. And indeed, there has been an extraordinary bipartisanship. That is not to say there hasn't been extraordinary controversy, but there's been bipartisanship effort uh, in the development of the policy, both in the legislature and in uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Now, one of the chief reasons that this commission has been able to act with, uh, with such uh, unity and with such acceptance is because of the leadership of the person we're about to hear, Chair Elizabeth Moeller. Thank you very much. Um, it is an honor for me to speak to you this evening. Um, I have been asked over the years that I've served on the commission, and it's now eight, almost, next month, um, to make quite a few speeches. Uh, but they are uh, seldom um, at uh, events uh, or uh, fora as prestigious as this one. Uh, the notion that uh, Yasser Arafat, uh, President Clinton, and Barbara Streisand have all uh, shared this same po podium is pretty amazing to me. I must admit that I'm slightly overwhelmed uh, by the occasion um, and by the audience. Um, First, I want to thank Bill Hogan for inviting me to, to be with you this evening. Um, the Harvard Electricity Policy Group, which is about four years old, um, has been a vital forum uh, for those of us who are interested in electricity policy issues. Um, it has provided an opportunity uh, for uh, public participants um, and private uh, sector participants, leaders in their field, um, who are involved in some way in the electricity policy issues uh, to uh, come together and to uh, test and discuss ideas. And that um, is uh, particularly valuable when you're charting your course through un uncharted waters. Uh, Bill is widely known for his uh, thoughtful uh, creativity, I must say, in the debate. And I know that I uh, speak for many of us who have participated in the electricity policy group over the years when uh, I say we appreciate both the hospitality uh, of the group as well as Bill's continuing contribution to the development of ideas in this critical policy area. Thank you. Um, this evening's um, audience is really quite a diverse group. Um, some of you have perhaps never heard of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. That's okay. Um, most people haven't. Uh, while others are um, as immersed um, in what uh, the Commission does um, as I am, and uh, you have a lot at stake uh, both in uh, what we do and how your uh, corporate entities are affected by what we do. So it's sort of hard to figure out how to talk to uh, such a group. Um, I hope that my, uh, my comments uh, will hit that happy medium of informing those of you who don't know what we're about uh, will not really boring uh, the experts and will hopefully uh, give the experts uh, an idea of what's happening now and also why we've been doing what we've been doing. Um, tonight I will briefly describe uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and what we do. Um, bring everyone up to speed in one fell swoop on current uh, developments in the industry. That will be easy. Uh, I will highlight Orders 888 and 889, which are our new Bible. Um, and finally, um, because of the uh, particular uh, unique role that the Kennedy School uh, plays um, in public policy and in schooling uh, uh, p uh, students of public policy, I do want to reflect on the role of the Commission um, and, uh, as we uh, go through this uh, important uh, public deb policy debate about one of our nation's uh, vital um, industries. Um, first, the basics. 
the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is a five-member regulatory commission. There are a bunch of alphabet suit re regulatory commissions. You've heard of some of them, but not all of them. Uh, you may have heard of the SEC or the Nuclear Regulatory Commission or the FTC. Uh, you may not have heard of the Occupational Self and ha Occupational Self Occupational Health and Safety Review Commission or the Mine Safety Health Review Commission or the like. There are lots of us in town. Um, we're the successor agency to the Federal Power Commission, was, which was established first as the Federal Water Power Commission in 1920. So we consider ourselves 75 years old. We had a birthday party recently. Uh, we're technically a part of the um, Department of Energy. Uh, but that really doesn't matter, except when we're a supplicant in the budget process. Um, we um, have a budget of about $150 million a year um, and a staff of about 1,400 people, uh, which uh, seems pretty big until you think about what we do, and then it's not enough. Um, while, like all um, agencies, uh, they're part of the federal bureaucracy, virtually all except the De Defense Department, I might add, uh, we're shrinking. Just last week, uh, Congress cut our budget request about $5 million, so I have the privilege of um, firing 30 people. It's not the most enjoyable part of my job. Um, we do have, and we're of course uh, having uh, a downsizing staff while our workload uh, is increasing and bureaucrats and government agencies get no respect, so I won't continue that line of discussion. Um, we have uh, jurisdiction over um, interstate natural gas pipelines, uh, both everything having to do with their rates and terms and conditions as well as siting those uh, pipelines. Uh, we have uh, jurisdiction over wholesale electricity sales, sales between uh, utilities um, or those who sell to, to utilities, sell generation electric, uh, electricity to utilities. Um, we have uh, jurisdiction over the interstate transmission um, of electricity, and that does not stop at a, once you get to an individual state's borders, which is one of the anomalies and difficult for us to figure out uh, how to deal with um, in this world. Um, we have uh, jurisdiction over interstate, over electricity, um, electric utility mergers, and also uh, siting and safety um, and operation of non-federal hydroelectric uh, generation. So we have a fairly interesting and diverse uh, set of responsibilities. Now, what have we done for you lately? It's always an important question in Washington, D.C., I can assure you. Um, on April uh, 24th, uh, the Commission issued two landmark orders, um, Orders 888 and 889, uh, that deal with open access um, and information standards uh, for the nation's uh, public utilities. Um, those rules are the culmination of a major effort uh, to re-examine the historic way in which our Commission has regulated public utilities. I want to try to describe to you both why we did what we did and then uh, also what we did so you can uh, understand uh, where we are in the context of the overall industry restructuring. Um, first, the why. Um, major changes have taken place um, in electricity markets in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, and the changes have accelerated dramatically um, in the last uh, four or five years, and we ain't seen nothing yet. Um, in my mind, the, the event that I can point to that began to really transform this industry um, is a law called the Public Utility Regulatory Policies Act of 1978. Um, Congressman, that's actually working on that and then the natural gas legislation at the same time is when I uh, first met uh, then uh, Congressman uh, Phil Sharp as a Senate staff person. Uh, PURPA, as it is known as it to its uh, friends and detractors alike, um, required utilities to buy power uh, from uh, independent uh, power producers of power um, at state determined avoided cost rates. Congress was seeking to encourage uh, alternative sources and alternative um, entities uh, to produce power um, and to force utilities to take their power. Um, the, one of the ideas behind the legislation is that if a utility bought power from this outsider, that its uh, customers would not suffer. So the 
power was supposed to be uh, sold at a uh, price that would be equivalent to the uh, utility's own avoided cost. Um, the PURPA implementation uh, over the years has certainly had uh, both its failures as well as its successes, and I won't give a whole PURPA speech. Uh, but it clearly gave birth to and recognized a, um, a vital new force in the electricity business, and that is the independent power industry. Um, the IPP industry uh, developed and uh, proved conclusively that someone other than the utilities could build and operate power plants reliably um, and, they are, uh, and make money for their investors in the process. Um, the IPPs were and are, um, I'm talking in, in FERC jargon, I'm sorry, IPPs, independent power producer, I try not to do that, were and are um, a vital new competitive force in the industry. Um, they also helped to bring about uh, technological changes in the industry. Uh, these were the lean, mean, new competitors. Um, and the new competitors turned out to be innovators, and they really scared the electric utilities. Now, some utilities were adept and responded to the innovators and did their own thing and, and were successful innovators as well. But that was not uh, necessarily true for a vast, uh, I would say the vast majority of, of utilities in the country. Um, the uh, new competitors uh, proved that you could build power plants cheaply, uh, more cheaply than the utilities had done so, and so they were, they were fearsome competitors in this new industry. Uh, the result of all of this change and new competition meant that there were, and coupled with innovations in things like um, jet engines, which are part of the, an integral part of some of the new uh, gas-fired uh, power plants, uh, changed. Uh, the manner and the price at which we can produce uh, electricity in this country and indeed around the world. Um, Congress um, um, began to recognize and uh, paid heed uh, to this new development with passage of the 1992 Energy Policy Act. It was authored in large part uh, by uh, former Congressman Phil Sharp and my old, uh, old boss, uh, Bennett Johnston, uh, in, the, in his, uh, the Senate Energy Committee, Senator Bennett Johnston. Um, the, uh, this new law gave the, our commission authority to order utilities to transport power uh, for their neighbors and indeed for their competitors. Uh, it was a hotly contested um, uh, statute. That particular provision was among the most hotly contested. Um, the statute dealt with dozens of other things, uh, but this one was um, critically important in, in the world that, that I work in. Um, the o Energy Policy Act also authorized a whole new class of uh, producers of energy, um, exempt wholesale generators, which meant that the utilities could now play um, in the independent power uh, uh, um, business, though they didn't have the uh, avoided cost rate and the special deals that the IPPs had had in the, um, under PURPA. These changed industry economics. You can build a power plant cheap, more cheaply now than you used to be able to do so. And you can make some money at it. Um, coupled with our new legal authority to order utilities to transport for others, caused us to re-examine our approach uh, to regulating this industry. Um, our re-examination of our approach to regulation um, led to a simple conclusion. Now, for economists, this is not a big deal. Uh, but for we, as, for us as government bureaucrats, it was a, a big deal. And our new rules rest on that simple conclusion. And that is we want to facilitate competition in wholesale electric power markets. No big deal if you're an economist. Scary, perhaps, if you're your electric utility and you're looking at your competitor slash neighbors. Um, and a revolution um, as far as the uh, federal regulation of this industry is concerned. Um, we concluded that utilities and their customers, and importantly their shareholders, uh, should not uh, suffer um, as part of a major transition to this new industry. That is, we concluded that they were entitled, for both policy and legal reasons, to an opportunity to, cover, to recover their past investments. Um, in the industry, but we were shoving them in the direction um, of this brave new competitive world. Because we um, were mindful of these past investments, 
Um, we did not have a huge and terrible fight with the utilities, frankly, in shoving them into this new world. I feel fairly certain that if we had not uh, paid attention to that, and if the new regulatory regime had been a threat to their economic survival, uh, that we would be in a very different situation today. Um, we did um, go through a major process um, developing these new rules. We began with a couple of miscellaneous cases at the Commission um, back uh, in the spring of 1994 and said in those cases that under the Federal Power Act that utilities could not unduly discriminate, that's our statute, uh, against their competitors. And they had to treat their competitors on the same or comparable footing um, as they uh, treat their own transactions on their power lines. Now, uh, Chuck Traband, who was on the commission when we were doing this in the electric, uh, in the natural gas industry, uh, probably wouldn't find that terribly remarkable. But I can assure you that the electric utilities found this to be a remarkable prop proposition. Um, we began to um, attach this comparability um, or golden rule, treat others the way you treat yourselves, to a bunch of authorizations. People wanted to come to sell power at the um, market-based rate, rates to the commission, fine, you can do it if you open up your system. Uh, you want to have a merger uh, of electric utilities, fine, you can do it as you open up your system. And we were, I would say, fairly, fairly aggressive uh, about this new religion uh, that we had. We, we um, used the utilities as a laboratory, told them they had to file open access tariffs, and lo and behold, they did. It was pretty stunning. And we then went through a series of uh, cases in the bowels of our, uh, of our organization where we try individual tariff cases to learn about how this new open access principle would work. Uh, we, once we got comfortable with it and knew how to write it, more than just a simple principle, uh, we went through a rulemaking proposal um, and that uh, a notice of proposed rulemaking that uh, a year ago uh, that culminated um, a year and a half ago uh, that culminated in issuance of these new orders 888 and 889 uh, last May. Um, let me describe them for you very briefly. Um, basically, um, Order 888 required open access transmission by all public utilities uh, and provides for uh, recovery of stranded costs. Um, it, its companion order, 889, requires utilities to establish uh, electronic information systems, open access, same time information systems, uh, to uh, tell others about available transmission uh, capacity on their system, and also imposes a code of conduct so that they cannot use inside information uh, in their, uh, that is not available to their competitors in their, in their marketing uh, operations. Um, the utilities were required to file transmission tariffs with us uh, by July 9th. Uh, we provided a handy dandy uh, tariff for them if they would just put their utility name at the top and uh, sign it at the bottom. Uh, they were in compliance with our rule. These were known as pro forma tariffs. Um, and lo and behold, many of them did this. So uh, utilities were given a, an opportunity to recover their prudently incurred uh, costs um, as a result of the rule. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. But the basic scheme is that utilities will no longer be able to use their power over their transmission lines to thwart their competitors who want to sell power in other markets. That, and so it, it encourages competition in these, in these markets. Uh, we also required, looking forward, uh, power pools to restructure their operations. The uh, Massachusetts utilities are uh, members of a thing called knee pool, the New England uh, power pool, um, and they are uh, due to file tariffs with us by the end of the year uh, to do so. We also set out guidelines for what are now called independent system operators. Lots of utilities are thinking of turning the operation of their transmission lines over to these new entities. Um, they're considering this for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is they figure that if they don't do that, some of their regulators will force them to divest. Uh, a bunch of their uh, facilities uh, in order to uh, break up uh, this monopoly. Um, we have uh, found this to be an exciting proposition in our business. Open access is a fairly exciting thing, believe it or not. Um, the rule, there's a lot at stake um, in this business. 
Uh, many uh, state commissions um, uh, are investing, I have several colleagues who are members of state commissions in the room, are investigating uh, whether they want to open up their utilities to retail access, customer choice, whatever you want to call it. Um, and we believe that our rules will enable that to happen if a state uh, wishes to do so. Um, California um, has already uh, decided to do that, and we're now dealing with some very complex filings by the three investor-owned util uh, utilities in California uh, to implement the California Public Utilities Commission's uh, restructuring rules. Um, we're looking at all the filings that uh, were occasioned by this rule on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, we're evaluating requests for waivers, uh, customized terms and conditions so that the, the pro forma handy dandy form tariffs that we required them uh, to file can be customized uh, to uh, take account of the operations um, in their particular uh, locality. Um, believe it or not, some utilities are using these customization uh, provisions to try and undercut the rule. Can you imagine that? They would seek to do so. But anyway, we're on to that. Um, we've also uh, required um, utilities to let others provide uh, services on their own utilities lines so that the whole thing will work more efficiently. Um, what is this, why does this matter? I mean, who cares uh, beside the utilities? Well, um, those of you who know me well recognize that I'm not inclined to a grandiose uh, statements or descriptions of the significance of our work. Uh, but I do recognize that there's a lot of cash on the table. Um, and if we can make this industry work more efficiently um, and still be a reliable industry, um, there is room for major innovation. Uh, there is room for a major consumer cost savings. Uh, utilities will have to build fewer power plants because they'll be able to share their resources more efficiently. And the bottom line will be a much more efficient um, industry to serve all of us uh, at less cost. Um, and that is a very significant uh, issue. Um, I'm reminded that the utility industry is the most, um, in the United States, is the most capital intensive industry in the world. Um, the total electric bill uh, paid by consumers is over $200 billion a year. So if you can even just achieve some savings off that, you have the equivalent of a major tax cut. Um, and there is enough, uh, enough efficiency that we hope that we can gain in all of this uh, to make it worthwhile. Um, if electricity uh, were um, included in the basket of commodities uh, used to track and protect uh, economic uh, trends, it would dwarf all the other commodities. If you look at the um, uh, telecommunications industry and the airlines industry combined, they're not nearly as large um, as the electric uh, business. So anyway, there's a lot of cash on the table. Um, and there is a lot of controversy that follows the cash, as you can well imagine. Um, we're um, limited to jurisdiction over the wholesale aspect of the business. Um, my friends and colleagues at the state level, we do wholesale, they do retail. Um, but if we can make the wholesale aspect of the business work more efficiently and more effectively, uh, I could consider that to be a major public policy initiative and hopefully a public policy success. Um, it, this, um, without wholesale transactions, uh, the modern industry simply would not work. Individual utilities don't have uh, the kind of resources to serve all of their customers all of the time. And it doesn't make sense for them uh, to have enough to serve everybody all the time. It makes sense for the trade to happen. So utilities have historically had a stranglehold um, so that they could thwart their competitors from getting to market. Um, and in the wake of um, 888 and 889, that stranglehold is gone. Um, before I close, I do want to reflect on what it means, for, again, from the uh, perspective of public policy or for those of you who are interested in government uh, to undertake such an initiative. Um, the Federal Power Act gives us a broad grant of authority. We're to regulate public utilities um, in the public interest. 
And like many statutes of its era, it's very vague um, and very general in nature. And even the more recent enactments, such as PURPA or the 1992 Energy Policy Act, have been, while they've been more specific, they have given us uh, uh, the commission a broad grant of authority. Um, our actions are reviewable in court. We're a very significant part of the caseload in the D.C. Circuit, for example. Uh, but even they give us deference, actually, when they feel like it. But as a theory of law, uh, they give us uh, uh, deference as, as a matter of law. So the challenge we face as regulators is how to use that uh, broad grant of authority wisely. Um, there's no owner's manual um, in the chair's office at the, office at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission about how to run a regulatory commission or, indeed, how to, regu how to regulate an industry. Uh, nor is there any handbook for any of us as regulators uh, about how to pro approach regulating an industry in a, in a time of rapid economic change. So ultimately, the challenge in my experience and in my view um, is an extraordinary challenge to us as individuals uh, to use our best judgment about what to do. That's why we're appointed to these jobs. Um, and to bring that uh, judgment to bear on the cases that come before us. Um, it's too simple to say that the electric utility industry is being deregulated. It's not. We're still going to have monopolies. We still have to regulate monopolies. We have to do, hopefully, we can do a better job at doing that than we have in the fa past. And there are certain aspects of the industry that can be made to be competitive. And we're trying to encourage the industry to be more competitive and to work more efficiently than it ever has to, uh, before. Um, we are um, indeed using our authority to encourage competition in wholesale power markets and to uh, break down barriers that discourage that kind of competition. Um, we're also using the authority of the government um, to enable a vital industry to change and to chart a new course toward competition. Um, the government role is vital in this transition. You cannot just say, okay, we've decided that all the stuff we've been doing for the last 75 years isn't a good idea, let her rip. Uh, that's just not responsible uh, public policy, um, and it's certainly not the way we've uh, approached our jobs. Um, we have um, approached our challenge with a sense of its importance. Um, the idea of, the, of sharing a, a part of the responsibility for regulating this industry um, is enough to keep me up a lot of nights, not all nights, but a lot of nights. Um, fortunately, we have um, a dedicated uh, uh, group of commissioners at the present time and a dedicated group of career professionals um, who have chosen uh, to work both at our commission and at our, our equivalent uh, state commissions. Um, and they bring uh, expertise of years um, uh, to, this, to this job. Uh, we have been able to channel that creativity and to make them think new thoughts, and they're actually excited um, about what we're doing. And that's uh, what is uh, really um, interesting uh, for me in my job. We've also challenged a lot of the expertise of the industry, and they've brought a lot of uh, uh, resources to bear at this problem. Obviously, they have an economic interest at stake. We understand that. Uh, but they have also uh, helped us by whether it's developing these new electronic bulletin boards or what have you. Um, and we uh, appreciate that, uh, their, their involvement in our process. Um, I will say that um, as a practitioner, and that's what I am, and as a bureaucrat, um, I get very, very tired of this uh, trite political discourse that leads us to think that all government is bad and that bureaucrats are worthless and that dozens of government agencies should be abol abolished. Uh, many of us are doing our professional best uh, to use the authority Congress has given us uh, to regulate this vitally important industry in the public interest. That, after all, is our job. Um, let me close with a quotation um, here at the Kennedy School. Uh, from President Kennedy's first State of the Union message, um, and I've used it before. It was not especially for the Kennedy School event, uh, but it is apt. Um, he said, let the public service be a proud and lively career, and let every man and woman who works in er any area of our national government, in any branch, at any level, be able to say with pride and honor in future years, 
I serve the United States government in that hour of our nation's need. Um, that message has been my challenge, and I'm grateful for the privilege uh, for serving in the position I hold. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have two microphones, and so anyone in the audience uh, may come forth and ask a question of Chair Moeller if they wish. Uh, this is an unusual opportunity uh, for uh, some of the folks. Uh, she knows how which questions she's not legally permitted to answer, so you don't have to worry <laughs> about that as an audience. Anyone have a question? Yes, please come to the microphone. If you just briefly identify yourself uh, and... This is always the scary part. You yes, know? it is. Um, is this on? Yes, is it on? on? Okay, great. Um, on the issue of, my name is Courtney Miller, the the urban from the Urban Solar Buildings Initiative. Um, on the issue of the environment, I know that's a tough word to say here. Um, no, it's not. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, purportedly, we heard that that Kathleen McGinty from the White House Environmental uh, Council, uh, White House Council on Environmental Quality, had had supposedly, was supposed to be um, saying to the FERC, um, we'll let you go ahead with, with electric utility restructuring as long as you can tell us that even though we're going to have potentially much greater output from Midwest coal plants, as long as you can tell us that somehow miraculously you can make sure that those emissions, pollution emissions, will not increase. And as long as you can take care of that, please proceed, you know, straight ahead for electric utility restructuring. What, what, has anything on that proceeded gone ahead? Or what is the FERC going to try to say back to the Environmental Protection Agency or to someone that maybe the Clean Air Act ought to be better enforced or reinforced or it, particularly in regard to the old coal plants, the old, the old ones, the big chuggers. Thank you. <laughs> um, that's about a couple of hour long conversation, and I'll, I'll give you the greatest hits here. Um, uh, we um, did an envir a full blown environmental impact statement analyzing the effect of the rule. Uh, we did not want to be before the D.C. Circuit and vulnerable to a stay order because we hadn't looked at it. We're not stupid. Um, and um, we did, we hired um, a uh, very, one of the uh, big uh, firms in town to assist us in writing the EIS. We don't have the resources to do that on our own in-house, um, ICF. Um, though we do have uh, a lot of people who know about these issues. And we an analyzed um, in the very proper um, um, macroeconomic way as well as a microeconomic way the impact of the rule by taking lots of assumptions about what's going to happen in terms of increased trade um, uh, amongst u electric utilities. And uh, we, at one point during the evolution um, of our EIS between our draft EIS and our final EIS, uh, we even, we adopt a bunch of assumptions that would have the uh, power lines from the Midwest overloaded to the point where they would melt uh, in a physical sense. So, of course, that's never going to happen, but we really did want to develop a worst case scenario. And what we found out is that um, depending upon your assumptions about the relative price of natural gas and coal, whether coal is king, um, and um, it's going to be given away um, versus natural gas being um, actually continued at the same relative price that has been relative to coal for the last f uh, 15 years, that the rule could have just a small effect at the margin. There is a lot of trade already between electric utilities. Um, emissions uh, under any scenario we analyzed um, will continue to go down, uh, even if coal is king, uh, through the year 2000. 
and then begin to creep up thereafter. And that's either with or without the rule, whether the lines are so full they melt or whatever. Um, we looked at it. We had a, an extensive, I would say, fairly public uh, dialogue with the EPA about this. And because the emissions trend is down initially and then up thereafter under any scenario, I think it was sort of the Nike symbol. Um, and we're just, we're just at the edge. Um, we decided that it was not appropriate for us as economic regulators to try to do EPA's job. We are very committed to help to and very supportive of EPA doing what it has authority to do under the Clean Air Act. Um, and we've analyzed the issue. There's no ugly black cloud coming from the Midwest, um, even if you get the, the clunkers really stoked up. Uh, they're actually mostly operating uh, at their capacity now in uh, times of peak, even without the rule. And so we are, we are supportive of EPA. There's a whole process under uh, way at EPA uh, to look at this issue um, as part of recent amendments to the Clean Air Act, and they've got a, a collaborative effort underway uh, that we hope will bear fruit. And uh, we're, uh, we've talked to EPA and to CEQ extensively about this, and we have a, uh, all agreed that that's an appropriate course of action. If the whole EPA process melts down, and if there is, and if they're authority under the Clean Air Act doesn't work, and they've committed to major new things as a result of this rule, uh, then we'll be back in the fray. Perhaps a long-winded answer to your question, but it is vitally important to us as, as uh, people who are responsible for this rule uh, to debunk the idea that the rule will, will you know, is an ugly black cloud of muck coming from the, from the Midwest uh, real soon. Um, and that EPA is not empowered to, to cope with it. Hi, my turn. Um, first of all, I'd like to say as a graduate student at the Kennedy School, welcome to the graduate school, to the John F. Kennedy School of Government. My name is Alex Rodriguez. I'm from the state of Arizona. And uh, my question uh, to you is a little bit uh, with regard to energy conservation, uh, perhaps a little bit um, differently than uh, what some of our guests, guests uh, would like to talk about this evening. But actually, um, I just see energy conservation as something necessary in the future. And uh, with that regard, I'm wondering what the thoughts are of uh, the FERC um, with regard to the energy service uh, companies industry. Uh, I know a lot of our guests here are going in that route providing uh, ESCO services uh, either directly or through unregulated subsidiaries. Uh, with that in mind, I, I kind of would like to hear your thoughts on uh, perhaps maybe even uh, forecasts for, for the future in terms of energy uh, conservation and efficiency. Um, most of the energy conservation and efficiency uh, initiatives that regulators have, are involved in um, have really been at the state level. Uh, we we don't have any direct role um, in 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 that. They have authority over generation, um, and they also have been involved in all of the um, planning for new generation sources, whether it's through demand side management programs or direct uh, conservation grant programs or 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 what have you. Um, I do believe that for conservation um, and renewables. It is a major uh, challenge to compete um, in this new low price environment. Um, I don't have, we have gone to great pains in what we have done to make it clear that um, we're supportive of state regulators' efforts um, and in the pricing formulas and stranded cost formulas and all that sort of stuff, uh, we have supported their ability to um, continue um, or, uh, or uh, conservation um, kind of programs, uh, renewables programs, uh, what have you, um, as a part of their uh, uh, regulation of the generation and local distribution aspects of this industry if they go ahead and do retail uh, competition. But it's really very difficult. It's hard to compete um, on an on a output basis 
conservation programs have a great deal of difficulty competing with three cent power. It's not tough to compete with 12 cent power. It's hard to compete with three cent power. Sure. If, if I may, I just uh, would like to follow up on that. Um, after assuming deregulation and assuming competition within the utility industry, um, after all the dust settles and you do the, the work that uh, FERC is carrying out uh, today, um, what do you think the outlook will be uh, in the year 2000 and beyond uh, in terms of, uh, again, in terms of energy conservation uh, and uh, efficiency in particular? I think it depends more on state initiatives than it does our initiatives. And I really don't have any personal expertise or knowledge about it that's any more than, uh, probably I should send you to some of my colleagues at the state commissions to answer the question. But we're, you know, we don't, we just don't have a direct role in it and I, I shouldn't pretend that I, uh, otherwise. Thank you. Hello, Andrea McDaniels from Reuters. Um, you talked about savings. Can you put a dollar amount on the savings that you expect to consumers from deregulation? And could you possibly um, assess some of the programs underway in New England, in particular Boston Edison's selecting what companies can participate, um, thus creating, a, some people charge, a, an atmosphere of artificial competition? Um, through our um, environmental impact statement uh, process, we did develop uh, numbers on the consumer cost savings that we um, expect from the rule. Um, we're just dealing, again, wholesale. We do wholesale, they do retail. Um, our conservative estimate is 3.8 to $5.4 billion per year. Um, now that's, uh, when you talk about a, an industry of this magnitude, it's just a, a small, uh, uh, piece of, uh, of what is at stake here, but it, it is significant. If you couple that with state initiatives in this area, the numbers uh, get really big and I al they also grow over time. So our uh, estimates are 3.8 uh, to $5.4 billion per year. Um, a number of states um, have um, various retail wheeling initiatives. Um, Massachusetts is just looking at uh, its own program, as is New Hampshire, as is Illinois, um, as is New York, um, and then some are going whole hog, if you will, and that, like uh, California, and they're, they're phasing it in. Um, we have not had any involvement um, in how they've designed their pilot programs. Um, it's not our jurisdiction. The utilities that want to participate in this programs, in these programs, or have to participate as the case may be. Um, uh, um, because they're uh, providing the services will involve uh, transmission and interstate commerce under our rule, uh, they have to use uh, FERC approved tariffs for the interstate transmission aspect of this. Uh, and all the utilities now have those on file, so it's not a big problem. So I don't have any views uh, in, at all, nor do I have any business having any views um, about the, you know, the Massachusetts uh, experiment, except to say that there are a variety of, you know, fascinating, innovative things happening in this industry. Um, and I'm glad to say that we're playing a part of helping it happen. So as an observer, you don't have any uh, ideas of the pros and, and cons of uh, how companies are going about it here in New England? I, I, I've got enough on my plate. I don't okay. really worry <laughs> about who's on Boston, Boston Edison's procurement list. I just don't. Thank you. Good evening. My name is, my name is uh, Laura McDaniels, and I'm a student at the, call at, the, at the Kennedy School. And I was wondering, with restructuring and um, competition being introduced into the electric business as it's at the same time that it's being entered into the telecommunications business on the local level. Uh, just from your own speculation being in, involved in this industry, when do you think that electric utilities might start to use their um, power grids to providing telecommunications services? Hmm. Um, some utilities are looking at that now. 
uh, the Telecommunications Act that recently uh, passed the Congress uh, does allow electric utilities to get in the telecommunications business in certain ways. Um, and the uh, um, FCC has just issued rules on that subject. Um, and uh, there are a number of utilities that are already, again, doing uh, experimental programs or have undertaken uh, experimental initiatives um, in this area. Um, a big part of the puzzle, though, is a federal law known as the Public Utility Holding Company Act, uh, PUCA or PUCA to its detractors, um, and that uh, uh, governs the various lines of business that the utilities can get in, and they have to be in, you know, contiguous service areas and like uh, business and so forth. So there is a major stumbling block to... Um, uh, wholesale uh, cross-pollinization in that industry. Um, Congress has debated uh, uh, PUCA reform for a long time. Um, they didn't get anywhere seriously on it this year, um, but I think it'll be a serious topic next year, And but that is a big roadblock to it happening on a wholesale uh, level. Uh, my name's Linda Donnelly. I'm here on a two-week HUD uh, Kennedy School of Government Executive Seminar, and I happen to be here when you're speaking. Um, I recently did an analysis in Ohio of public utility deregulation for my Regional Planning Commission Board, and I guess one of the questions that occurs to me is, uh, as we hear a lot about the equity issues in terms of deregulation, <clears throat> and this is a basic governmental question, I think, is with deregulation, it seems to me you have an increasing interstate commerce in electric power. Why is there not an increasing role uh, in terms of retail uh, consumer and, and equity issues for the federal government uh, in deregulation? Um, it, it's an interesting question. Um, the, the short answer is easy, and that is the, that um, we are prohibited by statute uh, from ordering retail wheeling. <laughs> it's real basic. Um, so that's the easy answer. Um, the long-term um, issues um, in terms of equity are very much uh, beginning a debate um, to be debated in the Congress um, and in various state legislatures. But the short answer is we can't get into it. Good evening. I'm Samuel Press. I'm a graduate student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, my question relates to the Environmental Impact Statement, or EIS, for Order uh, 888. Uh, as I understand it, an important part of the conclusion rests on the assumption which you expressed that the uh, coal plants will not dispatch much more than they already are. Uh, yet in a recent number of Barron's Magazine, the chief executive officer of Ziegler Coal Holdings is quoted to the effect that uh, coal plants right now are operating at about 60 percent of capacity, and he expects their capacity to increase to about an 80 percent capacity factor under a more open market regime. That's an increase of 33 percent. Now, that, that differs rather dramatically from the assumptions in the EIS, and my question for you is, what if he's right? What, uh, what will the Commission do uh, to address the increased coal emissions under that scenario? Well, for starters, that assumes that that capacity can get to a market, and it also assumes that a bunch of new power lines are built uh, or that there is a significant um, technological breakthrough um, in the efficiency with which the power lines uh, are operated. They scrunch more electrons on is the way I think of it in my very sophisticated analysis. Um, and uh, it's not easy to site or construct um, uh, new power lines um, in this country. Um, we did, as I described earlier, look at, um, as we should under NEPA, you know, mega loaded power lines uh, loaded beyond their capacity at the present time to simulate what would happen if the transmission grid were expanded. Um, and we just didn't get any, any huge impact. Um, um, as a result of this. Now, if what you're postulating occurs, 
Um, and if it, then the EPA has the authority under the Clean Air Act to deal with these issues. They are talking <coughs> under the, it, um, they already have um, um, SO2 emissions um, controls. Uh, they are talking about ozone uh, actively and uh, they have the authority uh, or else if they need more authority, you know, the Congress will have to give it to them. Uh, to address these issues. But it's not going, I'm very confident that it's not going to happen in the short term. Uh, and uh, they have underway an active regulatory effort in that area. Uh, I appreciate your answer. May I have a follow up question? Uh, I, I understand you're defining the short term as to the year 2000. And, and the CEO of Ziegler was talking about the next 10 years. So to that extent, you're, you're consistent. Uh, what if. I didn't know that. I'm glad. Okay. Uh, what, what if w without the. Um, hyper transmission loading. Uh, you just have the Midwestern coal displace more expensive Midwestern sources so that it's not necessary for those generators uh, to obtain additional or alternative transmission links. In, in that situation, wouldn't the EIS require amendment? I, I don't believe your hypothetical is a realistic one. Um, on, a, on a dispatch basis, it just is not a realistic hypothetical. You know, if that were to occur, um, and if the entire EPA regulatory process doesn't work, um, and if Congress is asleep at the switch on this issue, and if the world is, no, the country writ large is not worried about the environment, then we've got to have, then we've got a problem on our hands. But I don't buy the, the, the series of hypotheticals. Thank you. Hello, my name is Richard Flint. I'm from the UK and I'm studying here at the Kennedy School. You all, you all are ahead of us on this. <laughs> well, you could say in some ways. <laughs> um, I'd like to find out the sort of your, your opinions on the problems you've had in getting um, utilities to treat others as themselves, treat others like themselves, as you put it. Um, we have an expression in Britain, in Britain called Chinese walls. Do you, do you have the same expression? Yep. Um, I'd like to find out how porous they've been out here, because we've had the same <laughs> problem. From, we've had some problems with, in telecoms and uh, other utilities on this issue. So I'd like your assessment of the problems and how successful you've been here. We're building new walls. <laughs> um, so I don't know how uh, porous uh, they're going to be. This um, 889 has this uh, electronic bulletin board regime as well as the standards of conduct uh, for sharing information. Uh, we hope it's successful. Uh, we have some experience with it in the gas side uh, of, of our business, um, and it has been successful there. Um, there are certain, there's certainly um, an endless array of creative people who, you know, hack into the Pentagon or, um, or who are, you know, do uh, bad things in our society, but I, I hope overall that we'll have compliance uh, with, the, with the standards. And if not, we'll be after them, <laughs> if we can find it. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Bong Wen Kim. I'm uh, in the mid-career program here at the Kennedy School. I'm from uh, California, and my question to you had to do with consumer protection. Um, while I agree with you with, about the benefits uh, and the cost savings to uh, eventually to the consumers and retailers, uh, if you take telecommunications uh, as an example, uh, what's happening in California is a phenomenon of slamming, uh, where uh, companies are overly aggressive in their marketing practices, and particularly targeting uh, vulnerable, limited English-speaking consumers. Um, so my question to you um, is, uh, I know the federal mandates are not popular uh, in Congress these days, uh, but uh, can we uh, at the local level who are advocating for consumer protection adequate uh, measures uh, get any help from the federal level to keep the state level more accountable on that issue? Um, I, that ultimately is going to be a policy issue that Congress will have to decide. Um, in the telecommunications bill they just passed, um, there's an anti-slamming provision. Um, there's a, a very conservative uh, Republican congressman uh, from Colorado, uh, Congressman Schaefer, 
uh, courses in his district. And, and um, uh, it's, he is chairman, to me, course personifies conservative. I'm from the West, I understand these things. Um, and uh, he uh, is chairman of the House Energy and Power Subcommittee, um, uh, Congressman Sharp's uh, old post um, in the Democratic years. Um, and he has um, recently introduced uh, some re like, um, electric utility restructuring legislation that mandates a lot of stuff to be done by uh, certain years. In that bill, he has an extraordinary uh, grant of authority to us as federal regulators to do things if the states don't, don't initiate and implement uh, retail competition by a date certain. Um, he also has an anti-slamming provision in the bill. Um, slamming is not popular with anybody. Uh, so um, the, the bill was introduced uh, this year just sort of as a stalking horse and to uh, get the debate moving. But I, I believe that there is a broad bipartisan interest, as uh, Phil said in, in the introduction, um, in these issues. Uh, the lines have not broken down sort of liberals uh, versus conservatives, um, uh, just as they didn't in telecommunications reform. They were, it was a bipartisan initiative to bring uh, competition. And so we'll just have to see where it goes. It's possible, but I'm, I don't know how I'd handicap it. Hi, my name is Francis Butcher. I'm from the law school. I, my, I know that your commission's jurisdiction does not extend beyond this country, but I want to know your thoughts on the uh, Canada-U.S. energy trade relations with particular reference to your insistence on openness and reciprocity. Um, one of the interesting things I've been involved in in a long time has been uh, Canada-U.S. natural gas trade. Um, when I was back on the Hill, I spent a lot of time um, on those issues and uh, worked on the Canada-U.S. free trade agreement and as well as um, legislation to bring Canadian gas to U.S. markets. Now, it was under a different stocking horse, and that was to bring Alaskan gas to U.S. markets. But anyway, the bottom line there has been that Canada is a critically important supplier of natural gas to the United States, and we have a free and open uh, and reciprocal trading relationship with Canada in natural gas markets. And I consider that to be a real success story. Um, where we, uh, in certain parts of the country, uh, we have a lot of uh, Canadian energy, uh, uh, Canadian e electrons, uh, come to the United States, um, and there are uh, power pooling arrangements uh, with a lot of Canadian utilities. Um, they are not in any way, shape, or form um, um, anywhere near an open access um, environment in Canada. Some of the provinces um, have undertaken initiatives in this area. Alberta is the most notable. Uh, but, of course, they have really low prices, so they're not threatened by this kind of an initiative. Uh, but um, there is, um, we have said that for new transactions, you know, going forward under this new regulatory regime, um, if the Canadian utilities want to use the open access tariffs for new transactions, which is what the rule is all about, uh, they have to have, be open as well. And so we're, we're inching toward it. Uh, the debate is widening in Canada and indeed in Mexico, though much more slowly in electricity in Mexico. And I think in, in five years, uh, and that's just a number out of thin air, uh, it will be a very different landscape in Canada. They have government ownership of a lot of the utility assets, so it gets pretty complicated. Uh, but I think they will make significant progress, and we're going to nudge them along. Thank you. My name is Nakui. I'm from the Kennedy School, grad student. I'd like to know how big are the technical obstacles in bringing about this deregulation, and would it be possible ever for consumers to have a perfect choice? Um, four or five years ago, um, the utilities that didn't want to see competition uh, were just adamant that it was technically impossible to do so, and just adamant uh, about it. Um, and then utilities 
real, some of their management realized that they had an asset in their transmission wires, um, and they had an asset in their, in their surplus generating capacity, and they began to go after this new business in a big way. Um, and I no longer consider, and, and there has been a success story, and it's a success story all around the world. Um, and some of the leading uh, advocates of the just say no, you can't do it uh, crowd have been real um, leaders in open access in other countries, which is uh, sort of makes you question their, their notion that it can't happen. So the technical, uh, there, are a lot, there are many, 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 many technical issues that have to be solved. Um, there are lots of, there's lots of work going on in the area. To the extent that you give individual consumers the ability to choose whether they want to buy power from A or Z uh, supplier, you're going to have just an incredible uh, exponential growth in the number of transactions. Uh, but it can be done and it can be figured out. Just about out of time, we have two more questions. If they could uh, quickly uh, offer their questions. and Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Moeller, for taking your time here tonight. My name is Paul Messerschmidt, at present without portfolio and a member of the Industrial Reserve. Also a... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Come talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> An avowed neo-bilateralist, contrary to uh, Dr. Hogan here. And also, I do not consider FERC to be a verb, to be conjugated, I was FERC, you were FERC, they were FERC. <laughs> my, spe my specific question goes to the recent uh, saber rattling done by Northeast Utilities utilizing the Windstar decision, where I understand a bank successfully sued the federal government saying that the world changed and therefore you owe us money. And since I see that things like the Schaefer legislation and various state actions are basically teeing us up to a major litigation over some of these key issues, could you share your thoughts with us? Um, I've read the Windstar decision. Um, and I actually, I first heard about it from a, a lawyer who represents utilities. Um, it's, there's a whole complicated history there with accounting rules um, and transfer transactions and bankruptcies and um, so on and so forth, which is really not on point directly uh, to, to what we've been dealing with. Uh, but I believe as a matter of law uh, that one can make a credible case uh, that utilities are, are, that the law requires us to provide them a reasonable opportunity to recover prudently incurred costs uh, that were, and that means dollars invested um, in the old regulatory regime. And that to me is what the stranded cost debate is all about. Um, our rules provide for that. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a point in time when we're no longer going to treat these investments as stranded costs, so it's a it's a transition thing. Uh, the, uh, the Windstar case is interesting, uh, but I, I, don't, I don't know that it rates as saber rattling or whatever. Um, state law varies all over the map, however, um, and a lot of these dollars are invested under state regulatory regimes and state uh, laws on the subject. And I have to assume, as a lawyer, uh, that uh, the old fa favorite thing that you used to be able to get away with in the first year of law school, but not in the last, is it depends upon the jurisdiction, you know, whether they're, whether they're recoverable or not. Also, if you could share your thoughts on Amtrak as to whether they're wholesale or retail. <laughs> it's for Congress to decide. I think. No, it's fine. Sorry. Uh, my name is Roman Kamarchuk. I'm a graduate student at the at the Kennedy School. I was, um, I was wondering, given the greater expected competition, many people expect a lot of utilities to have financial difficulties and perhaps not make it. And given that, I'm wondering if you can comment on your policy towards, towards mergers, given this instability. What a final question. <laughs> um, there are a lot of, uh, of costs 
um, that are at stake here, and there are a lot of plants that have been built that are not economic in the new regulatory environment, in the new competitive environment, let alone the regulatory environment. Um, and w I think across the country, and indeed around the world, you know, we as regulators are, are struggling with how to deal with that. Um, customers are paying those costs right now. So they're not costs that are like newly in the system. They're there now. And we're trying to find the magic bullet that, that fig helps us figure out how to get from here, here to there. That is a large part of the government role in this transition. Um, some utilities might not make it. Um, I've been at this long enough to have gone through the Columbia uh, gas bankruptcy. Um, a lot of investors lo lost a lot of money in that transaction. Um, but they were not a, a viable competitor given their gas costs. So it may happen. Regulators are struggling with it. Uh, utilities are trying to position themselves through mergers to um, help that. Um, and we're struggling with how to deal with those issues in a merger policy context, uh, too. Um, it's, it's really difficult. Um, but uh, it just goes back to the, the basic thing that we want to try to do competition but without having, you know, a myriad number of bankruptcies along the way uh, so that customers continue to receive uh, reliable uh, economic power. And we're trying to figure out how to do that, and that's what this is all about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Chair Muller, we're very grateful you're coming to the uh, Kennedy School of Government, and we wanted to present you with uh, the poster that was posted all over Harvard <laughs> University about this event tonight. It falls within the very stringent gift restrictions uh, to a, uh, a federal official, so I, I, I trust you will not have to go through the elaborate reporting process uh, to receive this. But we thank you very much for your service. <laughs>